to thank you uh, for your word and for gathering us here all together. And we just ask that you, Lord, would be just rejoicing over us, Lord, as we delight in your word and we delight in just studying your word, knowing more of you, and uh, just choosing, Lord, to walk in your path and to do the things that you called us to do, Father. May we be encouraged uh, as we look at Abraham's life and as, as he made the right decisions in his life at this time, Lord, to follow you and be obedient to you. Uh, may it just encourage our hearts, Lord, to uh, do what we're called to do in our own walks with you, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, you guys, Genesis 22, right? A lot of us already know Genesis 22, when Abraham <coughs> offers his son Isaac as a sacrifice, right, unto the Lord, and as a burnt offering. And it's interesting, because you guys remember last week we were talking about Genesis 21, God fulfilled his promise to Abraham in giving him the son of promise, Isaac, right? Mm. And, and, and how long did Abraham have to wait? 25 years. Yep, 25 years Abraham had to wait for the son of promise. And finally God gives him the son of promise. And then God says, okay, now give him back. And Abraham's like, what? Right? But, but I love Abraham's attitude here because what is recorded to me sounds very accurate. And if that's the case, if the Bible's accurate and the Bible is showing his heart, showing his word and his conversation... And then all we, we see here is just Abraham's obedience. So it's pretty awesome. Um, and you would think, by the way, at this point that Abraham, his life would just kind of settle down now, right? After 100 years old, right? After all this, like, torture, I guess you can say, right? Trials, tribulation coming his way, his ups and his downs. And finally, ah, oh, the son of promise came. Retirement's here, you know, like, I'm just going to chill out and watch my son, you know, and, and do what I can to make sure, you know, the attention's on him. And God says, no, the attention's on you still, instead, right? And it, 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 it keeps getting tougher right now, but it, that's not the case. It's not getting easier. It's going to get, the trials are still coming, right? Mm. And he's still having his walk with the Lord, even at an old age. So God's not done with Abraham yet. And, and God's going to, once again work into Abraham's life, and it's going to be a very difficult time here. But this may be one of the most difficult tests, basically, for Abraham's life, right? Where he's going to have to offer his son, right? So, question for you guys is, why would God send a test at, in Abraham's old age? Why do you guys think he would send a test like this in his life? See if he's faithful still. Yeah. What else? Because yes. we're, we're being refined through our entire life. It's not until we're dead that that is done. Yeah. <laughs> so the tests are going to keep coming until, you know, until we put on that incorruptible. That'd be nice, though, God's all. Why don't you go to Hawaii for uh, <coughs> the next uh, 50 for years time. of your life? <laughs> I'm just, I'll keep you protected there. <laughs> yeah. There's no, like, well, like, the retirement plan for sanctification is, you know, being heaven and glory. Yeah, glory. Yeah. You know? What were you going to say? I was going to say, to see if he believes the promise. That's ultimately what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually, if I can remember exactly where it's at, it says that those things were, were done for our benefit. Mm -hmm. um, Romans is, 12. Romans, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that all of these things were done for our benefit, like as an example to us. Right. Yeah. His life, all those in the Old Testament. Yeah. So I, I was looking at this and I was like, man, it, was it to bum Abraham out? Like, is God kind of, you know, picking on him here? <laughs> no. It, in fact, it's the opposite. It's it's really to build him up, right? To uh, encourage him and to, well, it's the same reason God tests you and me, right? It doesn't matter the age. Remember, God is no respecter of man. God is, shows no partiality among men. So we're all treated in a sense equally, yeah. right? Because it's not based on us and our merit, but rather on Christ and who He is, right, to us. So, um, I, I would love it for the Lord, by the way, just to make me a faithful man. Be like, boom, you're faithful. Boom, you're full of faith. There it is. But instead, it's God's plan that we be faithful to Him instead of Him making us faithful to Himself, right? And it speaks to that relationship that we have with Him. So, the question how, how does our faith grow, right? Like, how how do, do we mature as believers? Just 
we want to get our minds here before we start so that we are all, you know, <coughs> in the same ball game here. Mm -hmm. Well, part of it is uh, applying the Word of God to our life and then having that uh, application tested for trials and everything. Okay. Spoon, what do you think? You're doing hmm? this. What do you think? Well, it, it, it talks about, you know, uh, it, it, as an older Christian, you, you're still eating, like, say, like milk, drinking milk, you know. And as you progress as a Christian, you have to progress in your knowledge of the Word, mm -hmm. you know. So the more you know, the more you're going to be responsible for. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Very good. I, I agree with both of you guys, and I, yeah, it's through the tough times of our lives, right? Through the difficult times, through the testing, the refining, you know, in our lives. Um, through those terrible times that come in our lives when we're just, you know, we're just like, man. You know, the, the testings come on in our lives. But we got to realize that it's, it's, meant for, it's meant for good, right? And it's part of God's plan of why these things are coming our way. Because it's not about, oh, it's because of my consequences. Lord, I messed up, isn't it? This is why these things are happening in my life. Not always the case. Right. Right? It could be just God wants to put a test to grow you and mature you. And, and, and He's testing you to pass so you go on to the next. And the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. Right? And you're like, oh, great. Um, but... Uh, and it's not for evil. God wants to, basically, He wants to ruin our lives, right? He wants our pride to be just vanished away, to be gone, so that all we can see is the Lord, right? And in His presence. And when we walk into His presence, we ought to say to the Lord, Lord, ruin me. Ruin every part of my life. And He will. He'll come in and just destroy <coughs> and kill and slam on the ground everything that you built up to be of your own stature, right? Of your own foundation that's, that says your name all over it. Mm -hmm. He wants to just demolish it yes. so that all there can be is Christ on the throne. And that's where he belongs, right? I, that, I'm so excited, by the way, for, um, for Sundays. You know, we're going to start in Colossians. And that's kind of what the whole book is about, is putting Christ back on the throne because people come in and they come in with all their views and blah, 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 and they dethrone the position of who God is, right? They just, oh, no, God really didn't create this, you know, the universe in seven days or six days, you know? He just, uh, it wasn't really literal. It was all, well, let me tell you, right? And you're all, come on, you know? But, but okay, because God's not powerful enough and he needs to use, you know, volumes of time, but in Colossians it's talking about putting Christ back, right? Where he belongs, who he is, right? And just putting everybody else in check and just making sure they recognize that. But anyways, um, so it's all about Jesus, right? He desires to grow us, to mature us in our faith so that it's just 100% Jesus, pure Jesus coming out of us. So that's how it should be. So as we start right here, I kind of read through Genesis 22, and I want to keep in the context of everything, and so I just wanted to make it very, very simple. I know it's an open conversation, so I made it very simple, so you guys are going to make it what it is. But um, six things that I noticed of Abraham's life, right, uh, of the lessons that he's going through in Genesis 22 specifically. So the first is the testing of Abraham. Look, look, look at verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Notice the, the tone of voice, right? It was very sincere. Not, what up? What up, yo? Right? <laughs> What's up, bro? What, what is it? <laughs> right? It's, and then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So, notice the word after. Go back to verse 1. After, right? All these trials and tribulations from where? From all of his life, right? From the previous chapters. Um, it, and it doesn't stop. So it says, after all these things, it continues to go, right? <laughs> it continues to happen. So just when you think the trials are over, right? It's going to be smooth sailing from here. You get hit with another one. But, but we need to... We need, to, we need to take heart to this because notice in verse 1, where is 
this testing coming from? From God. From God. Exactly. So we got to be serious with this too. It's, it's coming from the Lord for a very reason. And, and in verse 1 and 2, talk about a test. What, what is this test here? Abraham waited 25 years for Isaac, right? The son of promise to be, come about and be born from him and Sarah. And finally he's born. And now God says, okay, now go and sacrifice him up on the mountain, that, which I will show you specifically the one I want you to go on, right? And, and sacrifice him to me. And Abraham's like, what, what, what's Abraham's attitude? This, this is the ultimate faith test, I guess you can say, for Abraham, right? He's getting pushed, pushed to the test. So why God, God wanted Abraham to give up the most single important thing in his life that he loved so much. You guys get where I'm going here? Whatever was most precious to him, something he held valuable, right? Something he held and just cherished. And obviously it was his son, right, of faith. It was the promise. It was the one he was been expecting. Hey, you're the father of multitudes. Where's your children? No. Right? <clears throat> Think of all the stuff that he probably might have gone through, right, before he even had kids. Now the father of nations is having the actual, right, it's all coming about. And just uh, rejoicing in his heart, right, where he's like, man, this is great. Now God... God wanted him to give him give him up now. Give give up your son. Give him back to me. And now Abraham's like, oh man. So this this would be to build him up, to grow him, right? To increase the faith that he has in the Lord, right? And, and God does the same for us. If we're born again, when the test comes on in our lives, right? He's either making the test specifically, or he's allowing the test to go through in our lives, but either or, but it doesn't matter. What, what matters is God's in control, right? Mm -hmm. Whether he's making it or allowing it, <clears throat> he's in complete control of it. So, hey, praise the Lord nonetheless, right? It's wonderful. So we need to understand, like James, um, uh, James chapter 1 uh, when, when God gives us a test, it's basically for our own benefit, right? So no, no wonder James would even write in verse... Oh, there's, there's a picture. There it goes. Uh, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, right? Knowing that the test in your faith produces, right? And it goes on from there. But it's a joy when you fall into these tests, right? So when you fall into a test, take it as a joy. Were you, were you going to say something? Yeah, where it says, take your son, your only son. Yeah. Isaac, obviously, is not his only son. Right. Right. So he has Ishmael. 17 other Ish, kids. He's got Ishmael as his son also. But over here it says, take your only son, whom you love. But he also loves Ishmael. But Ishmael is the child of the flesh, and Isaac is the child of the promise. So, right. But it's funny how he worded it. You yeah. know, take, take your only son, which yeah, is absolutely. not yeah. his only son. Yeah. I looked at that and I was like, wait, it's almost like God can't see the works of our flesh. Because he doesn't even recognize Ishmael. Mm -hmm. But then again, he promised Ishmael that he would, you know, make a nation of him. Yeah, right. And that he would even still bless him. So, obviously he sees him, right? right? It's, it's like he's, yeah. he's still there to him. His only son of Sarah. Yeah, right? of the promise. Of the promise, right. Of faith. So, so. That's, a, that's a legitimate recognition <coughs> of Isaac as a fulfillment of God's word. Whereas... Uh, Ishmael was a fulfillment of God's word, but not according to God's purpose. It was Abraham and Sarah saying, hey, we got to help God out. You know, we're getting old. we better do right. something. And that always leads to trouble. You try to help God fulfill his own word, you know, you're going to be in trouble. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And because of Ishmael, don't we have a... a that's where, that's where uh, the Islam yeah. came from. Yep. Yeah. Well, not of the Arabs. We're in constant conflict. Yeah. <clears throat> what, our, what our sin produces. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, big troubles. Yeah. You look at that, you know. It's like what Eli said. These things are written for our example. So there's a big example for you. Yeah. You try to work some out in the flesh, watch out. Right. <laughs> you might end up with uh, some Arab nations around you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To kind of dovetail on that, like it really shows the, um, like the the severe, like the severity of our flesh, like of the effects of our flesh. Because I mean, you look at the population of the Jews, you know, the, the chosen people, like God's 
chosen, God's chosen people, if you look at their population versus the population of the Arabs around them, you know, like the flesh runs rampant. Mm. You know, it runs absolutely rampant. Yeah. And when we, you know, like just through one son, through Abraham and Sarah's one choice, you know, like here we are, you know, a couple thousand years later, still dealing with the effects of that sin. Yeah. You know, mm. how much, you know, like, and having that as an example, having Bible studies specifically about that, like right. how much excuse do we have for the sin in our lives, for the Zero. sin that we allow to run to run rampant, and the effects that mm. generations from now, they're going to feel that. Yeah. Well, this helps well, the context, too. The word, thine only, is actually translated unique. Unique, Thy yeah. unique son. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of the promise, yeah. Mm. Yep. So that actually helps with the Oh, yeah. Mm. I like that. And she not yet did read it today. <laughs> Good job. The word your only son in the Hebrew is Yaqid, which is the same word used for Jesus in the New Testament for my begotten son. It's yeah. the same word used there. Yeah. It's amazing how much pictures are here of of what's happening here and what of Christ himself, yeah, and what he went through, which is pretty neat. I'll probably give you guys two, but there's a bunch. But question for you guys, does God test our faith? Every day. Absolutely, right? Okay, but, but notice the difference. Yes, God tests our faith, but God does not tempt us, right? Just want to throw that out there, because some people get weird. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there it is. Cheater, you looked at it. <laughs> you must read the same book. <laughs> yeah. Funny. She read ahead. That's hilarious. <laughs> so God, God always tests us, right? To strengthen us, mature us, grow us, to um, deepen our walk with Him, right? To make it. Uh, stronger, right, in our communication with them, our relationship with them. And, but he will never uh, tempt us. But he does test us. Mm -hmm. And by the way, a test has to be, in order for it to be valid, there needs to be, uh, involve something very valuable, right? So consider this. What was, in this context, what is very valuable to Abraham? It's Isaac. Right. And, and that, this is the case right here that we're seeing. So something we love very much something that is very precious to us, right? It's something of value. And, and, and obviously it's illustrated with Isaac. Take your son, your only son, Isaac. So remember, um, like we just said, right? Ishmael is of the flesh. Um, but let's go to the second, um, second thing I see in Abraham is the obedience by Abraham. Look at verse 3. Let's see what Abraham actually does. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, <laughs> Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. So interesting. Notice Abraham didn't question God. He didn't argue with God. He didn't try to reason with God, right? Um, he was simply obedient to the Lord. He held everything open, I guess you could say, with an open hand, right? In other words, he didn't, he, he just realized it was all the Lord's, right? And he was willing to sacrifice all that he had for the Lord because he recognized it was all the Lord's, right? And God wants all of us to realize the same thing, that nothing that we have is ours. The people around us, are not ours, right? As parents, right? So unless we recognize, like, our kids, that's one of the first principles that God shows us early on and, and, and before when they're born, right? Is He shows us and reveals that to us is that they're not really ours, right? They're His. And that's why some people, a lot of people have, like, nightmares or, you know, certain events that happen and you're like, that was a close one. That's a good, re you know? And then you're like, oh, man. Just helps me recognize that's not my my child's not mine. It's the Lord's, right? So it's the same thing with us. Recognize all that you have is not yours. Why? Because the Bible is very clear. Psalm twenty four one. All that is what does it say? The earth and all, is the Lord's and all its fullness and all those who dare, dwell in therein. Right. So all of us 
are the Lord's. And we need to be willing to sacrifice to the Lord um, normally, basically, right? On a regular basis, we need to sacrifice unto the Lord. And I think we all do individually, right? I know in my own life, thoughts come into my mind, and I'm like, where did that come from? <laughs> Shoot down, boom, you know? Let's, let's get that, if it's a song, right? <clears throat> Sometimes you're like in a place and you don't recognize that it's actually a recording in here. And then you're, you're in your car, and all of a sudden, it just, boom, it hits, and you're like, what? Why would that be in there? Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, you put on worship or whatever, but it could be words, it could be images, it could be all kinds of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Scenarios, and, and I'm pretty sure we all do that. We all shoot it down, we, we stop it in its tracks. So all of us, that's, it's a little, little area of sacrifice, but others, you know, it's a daily sacrifice. We daily need to choose the Lord. Right, Romans 12 that you just mentioned earlier. Um, but, uh, and by the way, I'm still teaching Amariah the same principle, right? When, when she's with other little kids and they grab her stuff, she's like, no, it's mine! <laughs> I'm like, no, it's not yours! <laughs> yes, it's yours, but it's not yours! <laughs> just share! <laughs> it's hard. But she's learning the same thing, right? But we need that. We need somebody, you know, in our lives to say, hey, it's not yours! <laughs> it's the Lord's! You know, and it's a good thing. It is a good, and then at that time it doesn't seem good, right? You're like, but it's mine. <laughs> I paid for it. Yeah, <laughs> I earned it, Lord. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's all the Lord. So notice, but notice the way. By the way, he rose early in the morning, so he didn't hesitate, right? He didn't, you know, I'm gonna take my time and let me let me call make some calls first, Lord. Let me let me first go up the mountain and you know go and no, none of that. It was. Let's, you said it, let's do it, right? Let's go. First thing in the morning, boom, let's go. Maybe the Lord spoke to him at night, whatever the case, right? So the third thing, let's look at the faith of Abraham. Look at verse 5. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the, the, the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Mm. <laughs> so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and he laid it on Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then... They came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, right? But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. So, from verse 5, going back to verse 5, you can see his faith in what he says. Notice Abraham's faith in what he actually says. He says, we will come back to you, right? That is awesome. So, it, 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 by the way, it's in its plural form, right? We, 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 we will come back. Turn with me if you guys got a Bible. Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. So it's the hall of faith, right? Of the past Old Testament. Um, people who put their faith in the Lord and trust in the Lord, right? And they were faithful to the Lord. And the writer of Hebrews, uh, whoever the writer is here, he gives us some commentary to this exact passage right here, which is pretty cool about this event. Uh, dealing with the faith of Abraham that we're talking about. So Hebrews chapter 11 um, and question for you guys, did, did Abraham go up to the mountain intending to kill Isaac? Sure, seems like it. Yeah? I mean, took, the took a knife and out. Knife and yeah, brought rope to bind him. Yep. <coughs> Even the coffee pot agrees. <laughs> yes, he did! Right answer. And then the angel, of, angel told him, Yeah. yeah don't lay a finger. Yeah. Right. Yes. So Abraham, Abraham said he had some... Amazing faith, right? Some great faith. Look, look at Hebrews 11, verse 17. Hebrews 11, verse 17. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, 
offered up Isaac, and he who had re uh, let's start again. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, And Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also was received, he also received him in a figurative sense. Mm -hmm. So Abraham had faith that God would be able to raise Isaac up from the dead. In other words, he was going to kill him because he, it's almost like he knew that God was going to raise him nonetheless, even though he was, so he knew that it was a test, right? He knew mm -hmm. that it, through his son, the, the promised seed, meaning he was going to have many descendants. Remember all those promises God gave? Three of those promises, right? He would be like the, the, the numerous, the sand of the sea, the stars of the sky, as the, um, uh, there was another one. But he gave him three of them, right? Promises of how, you know, much people are going to come out of his son. Isaac, specifically named, so he knew it was through Isaac. So in Hebrews, it gives us all of this right here. So Isaac was, uh, in my, I would say, this is my commentary, Isaac was dead to Abraham, in a sense, uh, on their journey, because it took three days. And, and for Abraham, knowing from when God told him, it was already, it was a done deal. Mm -hmm. He just needed the spot, and it, that, was, that, to me, is amazing amount of faith, right? Your own child, that was the most precious thing you can imagine that Abraham even had, right? And, and that he loved. And so obviously, it's like uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. He's walking by faith, right? It's not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. So we may not be able to go through with this because of our lack of faith. And that's the idea for us. we got to recognize is, hey, are, are, can you actually go through with what God calls you to do in and of yourself? No. No. Right? <laughs> Hopefully if you guys have been to enough of these Bible studies, you guys get the idea. I always throw it in there. Can you do it? No! <laughs> Can you actually be a Christian like to the full extent of what God's called you to be? No! Because it's, be, it's perfection that God's called us to. How can you be per perfect? You can't. <laughs> so it has to be Christ in you, right? It, it's Christ in us. So this was, this was some huge faith. So doing it, uh, Abraham was doing it regardless if it even made sense to him at all. He's going to do it because God called him to do it. And that's what we all need, right? Look at, go back to Genesis 22. Look at verse, um, go, just look at verse 6. Um, and I know we already read it, but Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. Now, Isaac was pretty smart, right? He sees the, the wood, the fire, where's the sacrifice? Now, I can imagine for, like, the first journey, however long it's been, He's looking at his dad, and his dad's probably not talking, and he's like, okay, I got all the wood. Why is he crying over there? <laughs> he's looking at me with that weird look. Uh, hey, dad. <laughs> and now, like, that's, that, that's the picture I get. Yeah. And, and, and Abraham told him, hey, God would provide the sacrifice. And indeed, obviously, God did, right? The authorized version says, God will provide himself uh, basically a burnt offering for the sacrifice. So this points to and it speaks of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. obviously, right? Yeah. And, and he would be the ultimate sacrifice. You guys remember John the Baptist, um, John 1, 29? It says, And the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So this Lamb... Jesus was this lamb spoken of right here, right? But but he would come much longer, right? What was that, 2,000 years later? Um, something like that. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Can I throw something out real quick? Yes. Uh, you guys can correct me if I'm going too far here, but <clears throat> Isaac uh, it could be in a sense kind of, I mean, since we see the image of Christ here, uh, just the example of, of Christ being our sacrifice. Oh, absolutely. That's, um, he's, he's a type. Yeah, I mean, here with Isaac, if he's, um, if he's, obviously, you know, he's seeing some weird stuff going on, and that's why he questions his dad. <coughs> he's also showing a, a, a partial faith here as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because once his dad shows him what's going on, just like Jesus, you know, and he's, he talks to the Father, and he says, you know, if, if this cup can pass, <coughs> if there's any other way, 
Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what Isaac's doing here, what God yeah. gives us that, that free example of saying, you know, is there a sacrifice? Yeah. Is there a different way? Yeah. I mean, he doesn't, obviously, the scripture doesn't say that, so right. I'm not trying to assume anything. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think it is kind of cool to see that there's a faith example yeah. from Isaac as well. Just like Plus, you got to remember, too, Christ. Abraham is an older man, and often, like I was telling Josh, in Sunday school pictures, they picture Isaac as being this little boy, okay. when actually he was probably already a mature man, mm -hmm. well able to overpower his father. If he didn't want to be involved in this, yeah. Dad, you get something else and you ain't taking me out. You know, he could have, and yet he bore the wood mm. like Christ bore the cross. Yeah, the father job. had the fire, and he went willingly. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, and, and Isaac, oh, you get all the uh, Bible commentators that are like this, these, these theologians, and definitely <coughs> Isaac is a, a type of Christ. If, uh, I'm going to wait to see what Josh has to share because... Uh, you guys already took it. <laughs> well, yeah, but, but there's, there's, there's some other stuff in the chapter... There's no. some others up in the chat. I want to see if you hit on it. And if you don't, then I'll, I'll fill in a couple no. blanks. I did a quick study today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, sure. I, just I just wanted to point out that, like you said, James, that there's, there's no indication that he wasn't a willing sacrifice. You know? Yeah. Even though he was bound. Right. Jesus was bound. Yeah, right. You know? Mm -hmm. um, but perfectly. He said, no willing. one takes my life. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I my own life. Down. Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't a martyr. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, look at verse 9. It says, then, then they came to the place in which God had told him, and he built an altar there, placed the wood in order. He bound Isaac, Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. Now, notice, this is the fifth altar, by the way, that Abraham would make. But this altar would be different when, where the animal sacrifice is, it's not an animal, it's his own son. Yeah. This would be the biggest sacrifice that he would make in his entire life, right? This would be like the, the biggest thing that he would have to do onto the Lord. And it, obviously it's called a sacrifice, right? Otherwise, it's not a sacrifice if it doesn't mean anything to you, right? Let's get Ishmael. Let's, let's just say, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's get uh, somebody else up here, right? I don't care. But uh, it's a sacrifice because that's his son. And no question for you guys, why did Abraham bind his son? Like you guys just mentioned right now. Um, why did he bind his son? Do you, do you guys in, in kind of know? Yeah. Well... I think that, oh, I'm sorry, were you going to say something? Go ahead. You? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. Just, <laughs> I want to see if what you're going to share is what well, I was Well, you're probably right. I'm, I'm yeah. Totally, well, I was going to say, I think that regardless, it's speculation. You know, Scripture doesn't specifically say why they're bound in it. That's it's what speculation, I'm going to do right now. But <laughs> that's an easy answer. Probably doing the same one. <laughs> but, um, but I was going to say that, um, you know, like looking at Christ, you know, um, you know, further down the line, like how I pointed out, that he was a willing sacrifice, yet he was still bound. And I think that, you know, him being him being a willing sacrifice and being willing for for him physically to be bound was just was just um, like an ex um, example is not the right word that I'm looking for, but it was it's a picture to the world that hey, I'm letting them take my body, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm letting them put yeah. me to death. That it wasn't something like <clears throat> quick Jesus walk and then all of a sudden you know. He gets, you know, right. exactly. He doesn't get, you know, he doesn't, because then any anybody could claim anything, right. but but willingly allowing their bodies to be bound, you know, I think that's an example of their of their obedience. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't have time to look for it right now. There's a a psalm, and the admonition in the psalm is to bind the sacrifice with cords. And it's kind of a pun, it's kind of a play on words, because literally, physically, you are binding the sacrifice with these cords, but also the idea of a covenant is to bind, to bring together uh, as one. And so you're binding the sacrifice to the altar, and so you're covenanting by doing that. Mm -hmm. So I think here with Isaac, when, they're, when he's binding his son, that is also uh, emblematic of the covenant that God is portraying here by type. Yeah. Abraham being the father, Isaac being the son, you know, right. and the covenant, the binding, is, is all part of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's another uh, angle on it as well. You guys remember in Genesis 21, 
Uh, verse 5, Abraham was 100 years old. Sarah was 90 years old, right? So this is significant. So since when we get to chapter 23, we're going to see that Sarah, she's going to die at 127 years old, right? So in Genesis 22, we have a 37-year window in between 21 and 23, mm. right? So from 90 years of Sarah's, uh, well, when, when Sarah was 90 years old, Isaac was born, right? 127 years old, when she dies, 37 years are in between right there. So, which means the lands Isaac, he's, he's about 37, I don't know, it gives us kind of something there. People believe that Isaac at this time is between 16 to 25 years old, based on just those two verses, right? Mm -hmm. That we see in 21, verse 5, and tw uh, 23, um, 1. And, and so he's, he's not a little boy here, like you mentioned earlier, right? Mm. And, and this, is, this is where I was get, gathering, where I'm like, wait a minute. Because I've always, you know, my little Bible children's book, you know, like he's a little boy. <laughs> you know, like, oh, what are you doing? Like yeah, liars. But, <laughs> but here he's, he's like, okay, so I, here's the idea. He, in fact, in verse 6, just like James mentioned earlier, he... Abraham didn't carry the wood. Abraham put the wood on his son's back, which means this guy was pretty built, right? He's, he's not a boy. He was able to carry, and this is an altar. Back in the day, they made altars, right? So this was like a mountain, you know, moving, you know? Like, whoa. So pretty interesting. So the point is, Isaac didn't argue back. He didn't fight back. Instead, he was obedient to his father's will, whatever his father had required of him and asked of him. Kind of like Kyle mentioned earlier, and if I was Isaac, I would have fought back. I would have argued back. I would have been, uh, Dad, what do you think you're doing? Right? Like, um, I probably would have punched Abraham. Right? Like, hey, get away. You're, you're old. This is what happens to people. You know? But instead, Isaac says nothing. He submits to the will of his father, and that's, that's the correlation I got is it, what a be beautiful picture of Jesus here, right? As, as Isaac carries the wood, Jesus carried the wood, right? He carried the cross. Um, and, and as Isaac would freely lay down his life for his father's will, Jesus even said, in fact, in Luke 22, 42, saying uh, at, at the end right here, um, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done, right? John 6, 38 uh, Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. You're one ahead. Now you're too hard. <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, there it is. Okay, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So we're to submit to our Father's will, right? We all know this. When, when God tests us, it's, it, he wants to take something valuable from us, something fresh, something we love the most, right? And it's not to break us, but yes, it is to break us. <laughs> it's, not, it's not purposely like intended to make us angry and sin, but rather to break us and shatter us of ourselves, that, that we would be more of Christ instead of ourselves. So question for you guys, are you, are you willing to submit to him or not? You know, very simple mm. question, but something to consider in your own heart. Do we truly realize that it's all his? Remember Psalm 24, 1? It, it's all the Lord's, right? And, and Job, you guys remember, he had it all. Job had it all, man. He's got, but it, it all just falls upon his own wife, right? Curse God and die, Job. Right? So, thanks. You know, all was, my support. She was a Barnabas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. But instead, he realized, and he even said, um, the Lord the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Remember that? He recognized, hey, it's all the Lord's. I, I don't, he had boils on his own body. I'm, I'm not my own. Polly would even mention that, right? We're not our own. Our bodies are the Lord's. So um, I just thought it was a very interesting little correlation there. It's like one little thing. You guys named like a whole bunch, but there is a lot of pictures. But there's, it's just, it's interesting to see that uh, obedience of Isaac, right? And laying down his life um, for his father. And look back at the old days and how it was, that's just the way it was, right? They, whatever the father required of them. And I find that amazing because today we don't see that at all, right? Let's no. talk about obedience, raising up your child in the way they should go, right? There it is. 
Um, do you guys want to mention anything else there? Well, we didn't touch it either, and it's not something extremely big to, to get behind, but in, in verse 5 it mentions worship, and I think this is the first mm. time in Scripture actual worship being mentioned. And so it's just kind of confirmation that they were both mm. going up there to worship the Lord. And it's mm. just more evidence of submission, you know, yeah. of Isaac going along with to worship the Lord. Mm -hmm. Right. Just like we see Christ going. Yeah. And then being full submission to the Father. Yeah. And then worship being coupled with the sacrifice of with praise. The sacrifice, yeah. The sacrifice of praise goes with worship, and we have an actual sacrifice here too. So. Yeah. yeah. And they're on Mount Moriah, Golgotha, Calvary, right? Yeah. Right. Which is interesting, yeah. where Christ would offer Himself up and talk about all the pictures, man. It just keeps coming. Yeah. Right? I think this it, is it, the first. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, I think this is the first mention of a lamb, also. Is it? I think it is. Mm. Probably. Well, what is uh, <laughs> what is Abel slay? Like? His brother. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Abel oh, doesn't sorry. slay Cain. I, I always say it back. No, what did Abel yeah. give to the Lord Cain. as a sacrifice? A kid. I think it's a kid. A kid is a lamb. It's a goat. It's a goat. Yeah, it could be a goat or uh, a goat mm -hmm. or a uh, or a sheep. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Look at verse um, eleven. I know Cain. we read this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We both got that later too. I was like, wait, wait. <laughs> Uh, verse 11. So, it says, But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. Notice the fear of God mm. yeah, is within worship. Abraham's heart. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And so, question for you guys. Did God want Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? Yes, right? Obviously. Did God know Abraham would sacrifice him? Yes. yes, he did know. So remember this test was not for God, but it was for Abraham. If you get your perspectives wrong, you get your doctrine wrong, you get your theology wrong, you, get, you mess up everything. So I want you guys to put the perspective back. It's not for God, it's for Abraham. Because remember, God's right. growing him and maturing him in his faith, and it's a test that God's giving him. So... To test, really, to, to show him, you know, where his faith really was. So, turn with me to James chapter 2 really quick. Take you guys on a quick little route. Um, James chapter 2. Here in James, we get a little commentary on this, this issue here. And a lot of people, they have a problem with this text, right? This is one of those controversial, and maybe some of you guys are probably going to throw your Bibles at me. That's okay. Um, James chapter 2. Look at verse 21. It says... Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. So you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. So a lot of people have a problem with this portion of Scripture. They say, aha, there it is. Hey, justification is not by faith alone in Christ alone, right? By, by, uh, right? They, by grace alone. They, they say, oh, it involves works. So to some degree, I would say yes, right? To some degree. But when you, you get the context of what James is actually saying here, right? The, the point that James is making is very, very simple in the illustration of Abraham altogether. And, and, and the question is to you guys, did Abraham have faith? Yes, Abraham did have faith. And how do we know that Abraham had saving faith? How do we even know this? It was demonstrated by his works, right? So by his willingness to sacrifice his own son... That was the works that he was doing, right, whom he loved. So how do we know that uh, we have saving faith? How do we even know this? It's the same concept, right? Our right. good works, they're going to manifest themselves by our faith. If our faith is true, then our works are going to manifest themselves, and they're going to come out of our lives, right? So good works and deeds don't save us. If they did, then we're in trouble, right? <laughs> but it's, it's, yeah, it's the byproduct of faith, right? It's just it's what's going to happen naturally um, that we are indeed saved, basically. So that's why verse 23 
Abraham, it says, believed God and it was accounted it to him for righteousness sake, right? So how do we know he really believed? It, it was by his works, right? And that's the point that James is making right here. That's the context of the whole thing. So Abraham passed this test of his faith, I guess you can say, for the Lord by his works. So, and by the way, remember uh, back in Genesis 22, verse 11 and 12, God intervened, right? Well, the angel of the Lord came in, intervened because God already knew what he was going to do. God knew, hey, he was going to do it. God stopped him. Did he have to do it? No. Because God already saw his heart, and that's what God is after. So question, yeah. God, did Abraham have to kill Isaac? No. I would say no, so he just needed to be willing to do it. Because remember, it's the matter of the heart that matters, right? That's, that's Right. There it is. The command so, was for him to offer him as a sacrifice, not to sacrifice him. Right. I didn't catch that. <laughs> there it is. One of the things that it mentions, I mean, continue on from Hebrews 11, 17, uh, going into 18, it was he to whom it was said, and Isaac your descendant shall be called, verse 19, he considered that God is able to raise people, even from the dead, from which he also received them back as a type. And so, you know, he was doing it thinking, well, God will raise them up. He'll yeah. keep his promise. Yeah. And what's yeah. interesting, not to go too off, but if you look at, and the, lots of crazy stuff in there I disagree with, but within the Babylonian Talmud, you could see in the Sanhedrin tractate all the arguments that the Pharisees would have also believed in for the resurrection of the dead. They said, if God made the promise, he's going to keep it. Mm -hmm. That means if he says somebody's going to live forever, then he has to raise them back up. There's mm -hmm. text after text where they're quoting different scriptures, and it's interesting because you see the, uh, the Holy Spirit through the author of Hebrews actually documenting that Abraham had that same belief, saying if God said this, well, he's going to keep his promise. You know, even though they didn't understand right. how it was going to happen, right. they said, that's not for me. If he said this, I'm going to trust him. Right. And I'm going to walk through it, you know? Right, so. you know? Oh, I agree. That, well, that's the thing for us, going back to the, the matter of our hearts, our, our willingness to obey God. Do are we willing to obey the Lord? Are we willing to give up our possessions, our prized possessions, those that we hold close to ourselves? And even are we willing to give up the people around us that we love the most, right? right. Think of those the closest to you that you love the most in this entire world. Are you willing to give up that person onto the Lord? And just consider it. Hey, um, it, it's about realizing it all. It's all the Lord's, right? But he wants you to take care of all that he's given you. So it's one of those things, you know, when you pray and you give your life to the Lord, you give all it up to the Lord, whatever, all you own, and God says, okay, now it's mine, but I want you to take care of it it's now. to entrust and trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. basically. So, and then that's the idea. It, and, if, and, and when it comes to that point, you just realize that you have more after that. You have a peace now, but you have a responsibility now, right? Because it's now it's the Lord's, yeah. and you got to take care of it. And the Lord requires, in a sense, interest, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Like, hey, be and I'm trying to say, be wise with what He's given you. To come yeah. back and right? say, what did you do with it? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let's look at the fourth thing, and this is the really that was the longest part of the whole. These kind of like fly, but the provision for Abraham. Look at verse 13. Um, then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there. Um, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its, by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. Right? Mount Moriah is the same as Mount Calvary. So as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Interesting. Um... So by faith, Abraham said, the Lord will provide. And obviously he did, right? Not, not a lamb, but a ram, because the lamb would come some 2,000 or whatever it was, right? Years later, speaking of Christ, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, that John the Baptist would proclaim, you know, that behold the Lamb of God. So Abraham did really good. But the question for us is, when the test comes for us, basically to... To pass, are we going to pass? You know, are we going to, 
when it, when it comes our way. Um, the problem about this test is if you fail, the test comes back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It's just one of those things in life, right? You keep failing and failing, it just it keeps happening and happening and coming back. So the children of Israel, right? I noticed that they they actually circled around the same mountain for 40 years. Right? It's amazing. So they're always failing and falling short of the glory of God, just like we are, but we need the Holy Spirit in our lives. So let's look at the fifth thing here. Look at verse 15. The promise is for Abraham. It says in 15, it says, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you. Oh, by the way, um, from verse 17, let's just stop here. God, God gives Abraham four blessings because of what he was going, he did. God said he did do it, even though he didn't do it, but he did do it. Remember, it's a matter of your heart. Abraham already did it in his heart. But the first blessing God does to him is, blessings, I will bless you. Notice verse 17. And second blessing is, multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand of, uh, which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. That's the third um blessing basically God gives him and by the way so it's saying the third one is so the Israel right they'll prevail against their enemies and so obviously we see this today it won't ultimately be fulfilled until Zechariah uh, chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 Zechariah 14 verses 2 and 4 right right remember all the nations are going to come against Israel and, and except, by the way, those four or five, I forget what it is in Ezekiel um, 38, verse 13, that don't come against Israel. But anyways, there's a bunch of stuff happening right here. Look at the fourth blessing. It's in verse 18. It says, And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. But notice that word, seed. It's singular. It's speaking of one descendant, one seed, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it's talking about, well, obviously Jesus. In fact, Paul later gives us a commentary, Galatians 3.16. Now to Abraham and his seed, where the promise is made, he does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ, the seed would obviously be speaking of the Messiah, Christ Jesus, right? So notice why, why are these promises? Why would Jesus, why would God give these promises to Abraham? Look at verse 18, the end of verse 18. It says, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. So notice, um, Abraham obeyed God, his voice. And I love that. So thus the blessing. And how tragic it is when, when God speaks to us and we don't even take heed to the voice of God. Mm. And then we hear God's voice as believers, but yet we choose to disobey God's voice. And how many times we've been robbed, right, of the blessings that God wants to just pour on our lives, right? Like in Malachi it talks about. He wants to do a work in our lives, but, man, how many times do we rob Him? And it's so sad. Um... And it's because of our, uh, because we love our possessions or our people above Christ Jesus. And that's the sad part, right? Mm. We're not willing to give them up, whatever it is in our lives. And that's, it's wrong. It's messed up. Um, <laughs> yeah. But anything, you guys have anything there before we move on? Is it? Okay. We'll the last on. one is just the conclusion, really. Uh, you got the conclusion to do? That's it? That's it. All okay. done. Well, I got a couple things here. We got the sixth thing, verse yeah. 20 to 24. Verse 2, it talks about taking your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you've loved. That's the first time love is mentioned in the scripture. Anytime you got mm, yeah. something mentioned for the first time, they call that the law of first mention. That usually, whatever it's talking about, carries on a biblical theme throughout the scripture. And that is the theme, that, that God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten mm -hmm. son. Uh, so that, that's a kind of a really neat thing there. We saw how Abraham considered Isaac dead as soon as the commandment came. And it took three days from the time the commandment came until finally right. the angel dead. said, Stop, Abraham, don't do it, you yeah. know? And he received him back 
from the dead. So you got the type of the type of the three days of burial of Christ right. and raised on the third day. You got that right there. Um, in and verse angel. five, talks about Abraham. He says, "I and the lad will come back to you." Okay, which shows that he had the faith that he's going to raise Isaac from the dead. Right. But yet then, if you uh, look at verse nineteen, it says. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Now, you have to ask, okay, well, where's Isaac? Right, he's not mentioned. It's he's not mentioned. The bride, right? Now, you can assume safely that, of course, I mean, Isaac's not going to wander around the mountain while they go back home. He's with them. But it's interesting that the text Purposely. doesn't mention Isaac there. After Isaac was sacrificed and, and in a sense, resurrected, you don't see him again. He's gone. Until you go to um, chapter 24 and verse 62. I hope I'm not stealing too much of your no, thunder no. there. Oh, got it. But, uh, and, and there we see Isaac again appearing for the first time since this incident where he receives his now new bride right. to himself and he receives his new bride at the well of Lahorai. Sounds like eschatological yeah. events and happening. Yeah, Lahorai here. <laughs> is the well of living water. So that's cool. You got Isaac again as a type of Christ. Right. His his wife Rebecca as as a type of bride of Christ. And this is at the when the Lord receives us into heaven. You know, to enjoy the living waters forever and ever. Yeah. Uh, so it's like... It's exciting. Yeah, we, we see the Haggidah, which is the Hebrew name for this chapter. We see that as so much, so much typology. Uh, but yet, yeah, it goes on. Chapter 23 and 24, you got more of the same. It's like a trilogy. Oh, yeah. Of all kinds of types and typologies. It's yeah. huge. Yeah. Those are all, yeah, I actually have them written down right here on every one you just said. <laughs> and I didn't even catch... Two of those until you were mentioning. I was like, "Oh, there it is." <laughs> <laughs> I should really read my Bible. <laughs> I just have left. a quick question um, or a statement. Well, how come we see this as a foreshadow of Christ, but Orthodox Jews don't? And this is the Torah. The veil. The veil yeah. is over their eyes. Yeah. yeah. Well, they don't want. I mean, to. this is just this is just screaming to us. People have an agenda. And if, and if it's not fitting their agenda, and this is today's modern, let's, let's take the Jews out of the picture here. Today's modern pastors, right, Christians, yeah. uh, they have an agenda and they're not going to teach specific things because lest it expose them, mm -hmm. right? And they're, and they're right. after one thing, but usually it's their money, right? Mm -hmm. Or it could be their own fame, their own pride, whatever right. it may be, right? Their prestige. But they're, they're, they're after their own thing. And so it's a sad, sad thing. But when you teach the Word of God and you just let it expose itself, right? And expose you, because who are you, right? right? Like Abraham, here I am. <laughs> right? right? But let you come out as you are to the Lord. And then there's nothing to be exposed. You're already exposed. There's nothing Amen. to be ashamed of because you're already, right? Everybody right. knows. <laughs> yeah, yes. So it's a good thing. And that's kind of the work that God does in our lives. It's so cool. Part, part of the reason why they don't see it is because they're not necessarily in the to not the Old Testament. But instead, they're reading what the rabbis said. Right. Some later right. on rabbis, yeah. it's all filtered through different things. Not to mention, even way back in Jesus' time, and there's some interesting things that they wrote around Jesus' time, but there's still stuff they were wrong about. And um, John chapter 5, when Jesus is talking to them, I mean, he basically lays out the whole game plan, if you will, mm -hmm. eschatologically. It's right there. Nobody could say Jesus didn't explain it to them. He did. They didn't want to listen. And he actually tells them that it, they'll be accountable for Moses because it's Moses they don't believe. So they don't even believe their own Torah. That's, that's the problem. It is. And he says, your, your father's the devil, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's a different passage, but this one, um, okay, I mean, A lot of people sometimes will take this out of context and think it means something else. But it says, Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you, you believe will believe me. me. For he wrote of me. But but if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Right. So, and it's, that's... 
That's at the heart of it. I forget. I'm so bad at remembering where scriptures are, but I think the it's alphabet like, soup problem. That's exactly what it is. It's so funny that you never forget that. Um, but um, but Jesus addressed it also whenever he um, talked about the rich man and Lazarus. You know, mm -hmm. he said, you know, they don't believe the prophets, you know, and the law, so they're not going to believe when somebody rises from the dead. Right. And you know what's interesting yeah. though is the uh, not the crazy messianics, Luke's but the true. actual messianics. Thank you. Who come to the Lord? They say they just started reading, the reading their Old Testament, yeah. mm -hmm. and then it made sense. You know, mm -hmm. certain things because mm -hmm. they're saying, "Oh, well, wait a minute, yeah. what if I just look at this not like, like not like they told?" You're right. You read know? it for what it says, yeah. rather, than, rather than read into it what the rabbis at what it say. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. One other thing I, I, I forgot to mention too, in verse 14, it talks about Abraham uh, called name that place Jehovah Jireh, which is in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Mm -hmm. It says in the old now it can be seen or provided because if you're seeing it, it's there, it's provided. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting though, if it was if Abraham saw something, it could be that God gave him a vision of Calvary because in John eight fifty six it says that Abraham saw my day and rejoiced to see it. Right. And and the Pharisees are like, well, you're not even 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham, and yeah. that's when he goes, well, before Abraham was, I am. Yeah. Right. And so it's like, hmm, yeah. maybe yeah. that when Jesus was saying he he saw my day, maybe that's part of what he's referring it's to, possible. Jehovah Jireh, in yeah. the Mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And he, he maybe he realized this. I'm doing a kind of reenactment in advance, right. <laughs> you know, before the actual event. I'm kind of it's a model, just right. like I'm doing this, you know. Dress rehearsal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that. My like dress nice. rehearsal. Yeah, excellent. I love that too because Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, well, it says the Lord will provide here, but God is our provider, and that goes back to the I am, right, of God in Exodus three. But speaking that He is our need, that He will provide. He will not provide our wants. You know, Psalm twenty three, where you do, I shall not want. But he will provide our need, mm -hmm. not needs, right? But our need in speaking of him, he is our all in all that mm -hmm. we need, right? He is what we and need. And speaking of Christ more than our substance and our, right, faith, yeah. daily, whatever. And then going back to the law thing, Galatians 3, just read it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Homework. It just You want to live by the law? Then you're going to die by the law, right? You want to live on in the spirit? In other words, it says... You're gonna. Be, you want to be dumb, right? You don't want to walk with wisdom. Then go ahead, do your thing in the law. But Christ took on our curse, right? Speaking of the wood, he died upon the tree, and he took on. He became our curse for us. Be right. And it goes back to the gospel again, right there in Galatians. So um, I love it. How it's it's all about Jesus, right? Amen. He is our all in all. And if we want to be like the Pharisees and, and think so much and just you know accept Christ except like besides Christ right then we're, we're dumb but if you want to be wise then accept Christ right let him be your all in all let him be everything Amen. Um, let's look at the, the here's the relatives of Abraham that it's going to give us here look at verse 20 um, verse 20 it says now it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham saying indeed Milko also has borne children to your brother Nahor now um, Nahor is one of Abra Abraham's brothers Nahor had married Milka, so his niece, right? And, and Abraham's other brother, Haran's daughter. It's, it's pretty uh, interesting, the family farm thing going on here. It's kind of, Yes. Let's go to verse 21, guys. Hurry. It says, Huz, his firstborn, Buzz. Wow. Like Buzz and Buzz. Yeah. His brother, Camille, the father of Aram, Chesed, Hezo, uh, this. I actually looked up all these guys, and I couldn't find any of these guys. Verse 23, in Bethel we got Rebekah, these eight milk aboard to Nahor, Abram's brother, his concubine, whose name was Remua, also bore Teb Teba, Gama, these other ones, right? Um, there you go. Kyle can pronounce them. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> I tried looking these guys up, and I, I honestly, I can't find not one thing about any of them. The only one I could find anything about is Rebecca. We right. all know Rebecca is going to come up in chapter 24. She is going to end up marrying Abraham's son, Isaac, the promised, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and it's all beginning right here in chapter 22, where God's going to just explode this family, right? And so what is the point of this whole chapter? I, I think just two things I jotted from this whole thing is God wants us to put him number one, right? First above anybody and anything in our entire lives, right? Mm -hmm. So Jesus even said, Matthew 6, he said, uh, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall Amen. be added to you. Amen. So God also wants us to love him the most, right? So if you love anybody else before God, that's obviously idol. that's an idol, right? Um, America has got, right? Yeah. But don't put those idols before God. Don't put anything before God, but put God before everybody and everything, right? Deuteronomy 6, uh, it's very, we know this, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? With all your soul, with all your strength. Just a love, the Lord is stressed right here. And every example it could be, right? To love Him supreme, love Him the most. And when we hold everything and everyone with the heart of just realizing that they're not ours, right? That they're the Lord's. Then we're going to realize, hey, we're, we're going to have that peace in our lives where we're just like, God, they're yours. <laughs> and, it, and it seems like you don't need to go through that test now, right? Mm. You, you, just, you just went, mm. right? You just... 40 years around the mountain? I don't think so, right? Like, I'm past this one, right? I'm going right ahead, right? Coming on promised land. So just stay faithful to the Lord. Look to his promises. Let him bring those tests on in your life. And he does, right? The Lord's been bringing little tests to me. And, and I would say it's trials, right? Little ones. But to me, I'm all, Wah! And then it takes me like five minutes to finally like click in and be like, trust the Lord, dude. Come on. <laughs> and finally I'm like, oh, no, yeah, you're right. You gotta pray. <laughs> who, who am I thinking right of like I could figure this out? Just pray. Yeah. And, and it's always like after you're done praying, it's like you don't even have yeah. to literally you don't even have to think about it anymore. Yeah. You gave it away. Yeah. So why would you rob God and take it back? Let it go. Don't play ping pong. With yeah. God. Hey God, I'm just joking. <laughs> JK. Yeah. But, uh, so you didn't, uh, Nahor's eldest sons, you didn't find anything about those two? Uh-uh. Because I, I, I found a little tidbit that uh, Huzz and Buzz, they opened up the first barbershop. Oh! <laughs> oh, <laughs> my God, man. Never ended. You're leaving early, dude. <laughs> Do you know that by experience? <laughs> oh, <laughs> <man. laughs> oh. <laughs> I just want to say as a point of clarity that um, with the inner marryings, you know, within mm. cousins, etc., you know, like that was the way that God chose to use, like, to establish the, the Jews as a people group. And it wasn't until generations later that right. he made the law that says, hey, okay, there's Moses. plenty of you now. Yeah. Right. No more need to marry your, your near kin. Right. right. So right. it wasn't something that's still permissible. And right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of people make the issue, uh, the non-believers. Right. Well, oh, you got incest in the Bible. Well, that was before yeah. Moses. Yeah. The genetic pool for the people of Israel needed to be established. And so the, right. what we call inbreeding at that time the genetic pool being much newer, yeah. you know, you know, now we're aged to her as a race, we're like well over 6,000 years old as a people, yeah. but back then, you know, it was more viable, if they try to do that now, which they have, you end right. up with circus freaks, that's where right. all these came from in England, yeah. the royal families were intermarrying, and they ended up with these, seven arms, yeah, Literally. so they would uh, uh, you know, get rid of them, and they end up yeah. in a freak show in a circus, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's pray. Yeah. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for uh, <laughs> just showing us. There's so much here, Lord, and I can see all the excitement in all of us, Lord, mm. about your word and how amazing you are and how you've just uh, put everything so unique, Lord, within your word that we can find these treasures, Lord, and just be blessed by yes. them. We pray, Lord, that we would continue to depend on you and just bring our our everything to you, our cares, Lord, just realizing that you care for us and that you 
uh, are our creator. You have marked out our path, Lord. May we continue to allow your word to light it up, Lord, and yes, just Lord. reveal to us those things daily that we can give up the things that we're holding on to and live that sacrificial life that you called us to live, Lord, and be willing, Lord, to just lay down our lives for our brethren, Lord, for those around us, and uh, help us, Lord, to, to literally um, pour ourselves out, Father, and allow us, Lord, just to just allow you to do a work in our hearts, Lord. May we not put any kind of uh, restrictions or um, anything on you, Lord. Do all that you want to do in our hearts, Lord, whether a limited amount or a whole bunch of it. Um, do whatever you will, Father, in our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.